delighted to welcome Catherine Berry, Professor Catherine Berry, to present today to talk about uh, one of her studies about psychologically informed ward based intervention. So I'm going to hand over to Catherine in a minute, but just to say that, that you, for people that have been before, the format will be the same, that Catherine's going to prevent, present a bit of an overview of the paper and then the last 10, 15 minutes or so is given over for questions and discussions. So I'll hand over to Catherine who can uh, introduce herself. OK, OK, thanks. thanks. Can you hear some feedback actually, because I can my end. I could a minute ago, but it's stopped for me now. I'll turn okay. my mic off and. Um... OK, hopefully that'll be OK. So I'm Catherine Berry. I'm Professor of Clinical Psychology based at Manchester University. Um, I'm also co-director of um, the Complex Trauma Resilience Research Unit. Um, and I thought this project was particularly relevant to talk about within your journal club um, because it's around accessing psychological therapy um, on acute inpatient wards, but a lot of the work is delivered um, by psychologists, but also by nursing colleagues. So the full reference of the paper is, um, is here. It's published in Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy last year. Um, it's looking at feasibility of um, developing a model of psychological therapy on acute wards specifically. But I'm going to talk through the study that's described in the paper today and then we can pause for questions about it, as Rob said. So, the study is part of an NIHR programme grant um, with the overall remit of increasing access to therapies on acute wards. There's three parts to the programme grant. The first part of the first work package aims to develop or aims sorry to develop a psychological therapy or psychological therapy service that we could, could deliver on acute wards and um, the reason being a lot of psychological therapy in the community is um particularly for people with severe mental health problems is 16 sessions of approximately one hour therapy but that's not necessarily suitable for an acute ward where people aren't staying that long or people are experiencing high levels of distress also when you've got you're working very closely with a multidisciplinary team so we need to think a bit differently about how we're going to deliver therapy in that setting so the first 18 months of project in work package one was all about developing a therapy model and the paper that i'm going to talk about is part of that development work the second stages of the programme grant, which we're currently in now, is running a randomised control trial, comparing the intervention that we developed and we tested in this pilot study um, to treatment as usual. Um, and we're comparing it to treatment as usual in terms of patient outcomes, um, staff wellbeing, and both patient and staff satisfaction with the ward environment. Um, and running alongside that trial, we've got an implementation study that looks at doing observations and qualitative interviews on the ward to look at contextual factors that influence implementation of the intervention. OK, so as I said, the project I'm going to talk about today, or the part of the study that I'm going to talk about today, was within work package one, um, where we did some preliminary work to develop a model, and then we tested it um, across two pilot wards. And this is the model that essentially we came up with, and this was based on a systematic review of the literature, which looked at barriers and facilitators to implementing um, psychological interventions on acute wards. It was based on lots of qualitative work that we did with staff, service users, carers, other key stakeholders on what therapy might look like on inpatient wards, um, and a big kind of consultation exercise where we got experts together, including experts by experience, to kind of develop the model. It's a, it's a systemic model, so it's very much engage, engaging with the wider ward system. So there's a psychological therapist on the ward who attends multidisciplinary team meetings, handovers, staff support groups, and also engages in their own um, process of supervision. And that psychologist works at three different levels. So on level one, they work to develop formulations um, in relation to each patient um, with members of the team. So there's a team formulation or a team of shared understanding of each service user's needs as opposed to one that's purely based on diagnosis. At level two, so people that um, might benefit from more psychological input um, would receive nurse delivered interventions whereby the psychologist trains and supervises nursing staff to work alongside you, service users to um, carry out some very guided kind of self-help type psychological interventions on quite subscribed problems. And then at level three, the psychologist who is ward based works with people with more complex presentations on providing psychological therapy, but very much focused on assessment and formulation with a view to trying to understand what brought them in hospital in the first place and what might keep them out of hospital again. <laughs> 
So as I say, this model was based on our preliminary work and our kind of consensus conference where we tied all the, the loose ends together. Um, the funders wanted us to pilot it before we went to full trial, so we carried out the pilot of the model um, on two wards, one of which was um, Bronte Ward in Withenshaw and one of which was Taylor Ward in Pennine Care. Um, one of the wards was an existing ward-based psychologist who increased at her hours and um, for part of the study to implement our model. Um, the psychologist in Pennine Care was somebody that was newly appointed to post. Um, psychologists were part-time on the ward, which I guess is quite typical of the amount of time that a psychologist might spend on a ward. And the intervention period that we tested was over a six-month period. And we wanted to not necessarily demonstrate effects in terms of outcomes because it's a pilot study but just more look at feasibility and implementation issues that would help us um, iron out difficulties um, that we might encounter in a, in a larger scale trial but we did look at outcome measures mainly for the purpose of seeing how people would engage with the outcome assessment um, and we looked at outcome measures that we might want to look at in the bigger trial and indeed we went on to look at in the bigger trial such as serious incidents which we did through Datex data um, perceptions of patient well-being, which is through the webwebs, both st patient and staff perceptions of ward atmosphere, staff levels of burnout and service use and service costs from the service user perspective or what services service users were using. In order to look at implementation issues, we asked our psychologists to complete um, a diary of what they were doing um, at randomly generated weeks um, during the intervention period. So we randomly selected one week per month where they logged down their activities. Um, and we felt it was really important that the diary focused on not only what they did, but what was planned and what actually went ahead because we were aware that in the inpatient setting, things would often be scheduled but not go ahead for various reasons. So we wanted to try and log some of that those factors. And then we carried out semi-structured interviews with patients and staff to, understood what, to understand what had been um, delivered. Um, and we also say completed um, the outcome measures. In terms of the feasibility data, we recruited or we aimed to recruit 10 staff and 10 patients per ward um, and we were able to achieve that target within one month, um, which is a similar sort of time frame that we ran before in terms of the trial. Um, in terms of follow-up rates, we wanted to assess how easy it would be to follow up staff and patients in terms of both station, patient and staff turnover. Uh, we got a reasonable rate of staff follow-up and um, we'd lost people because people at the beginning of the project had, that were there at the beginning had left posts. Um, we really struggled to follow up patients though, which I think is quite typical of these settings. And we only managed to follow up 30% of the patients and those are the patients that were still on the ward. Um, we st really struggled to follow people up in the community, which I'll talk to you a bit about towards the end. We had four people who didn't consent to follow up at baseline because we were asking people whether they consent to be followed up. We had people that were easy to locate in the community, um, but didn't consent when, we, when the researchers went out to see them. Um, and it's just those six people on the ward that were still on the ward that did consent to follow ups. Um, and we struggled to locate six people um, because they were no longer under care teams and the mobile numbers that they given us at the beginning of the study no longer worked, which is quite typical of this population. So the feasibility of the study looked reasonable, but there's some concerns about the follow ups. In terms of the feasibility of implementing the intervention, we managed to train all ward based staff in psychological models or psychological ways of working. Um, we delivered four half day workshops on one ward and one half day workshop on the other ward. We were kind of a bit, of fle bit flexible in the pilot study in terms of what the ward wanted in terms of training and in terms of the amount of training that they wanted to try and give us an indication of what wards are asking for and what be deliverable. Um, the type of training that was offered was based on trauma and mental health, with a focus on the trauma of the admission process, um, the role of therapeutic relationships and the role of staff care. We also, on one of the wards, implemented more focused training packages on working with anxiety, anger, behavioural activation, emotional regulation and around normalising symptoms of psychosis. So these were very discrete kind of focused training packages that would enable um, staff then to implement some quite focused interventions with service users. Um, we asked the psychologists, as I said earlier, to keep activity logs. We looked at the balance of the time. Um, a lot of time was 
spent on around formulation because obviously that's a key part of our model but it did vary towards the extent to which we were able to do a formulation with a full team versus a formulation just between the, the psychologists themselves and a key member of nursing staff. Um, there was supervision of, of nurses in the psychological approaches and that was either delivered one-to-one -one or sometimes for ease with groups of nurses. We were able to run reflective practice sessions, which were alternating between team formulation sessions. The psychologist spent a significant proportion of time in ward round and handovers, sort of influencing team discussions about service users. Um, and they were able to provide one-to-one -one therapy with a, a slightly shorter duration of therapies in the community. Um, and they engaged in obviously in their own supervision sessions with a heavy focus on kind of thinking through barriers to implementation um, and the ward dynamics as opposed to necessarily one-to-one -one work with service users. I guess key reflections from our interviews suggested that the kind of model that um, we were trying to implement was accept, 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 acceptable to people, but the one element that we did struggle with was the nurse-led interventions, which is more challenging um, with nurses not necessarily seeing the interventions as being part of their role or having lots of other competing demands on their time, so they not having capacity to support that delivery. Um, so towards the end, we also looked at training nursing assistants as well as qualified nurses in, in some of the more focused sessions. Um, people are suggesting it's not only the psychologist that's influential, it's all the kind of key players within the ward and particularly senior management support. So if the senior managers were behind the, the project and the intervention, it really kind of made things happen. Nurses really valued training that was practical and not just training that was theoretically based. They want practical, wanted practical tips on how to manage service users, regulate emotions and, and cope with difficulties um, using psychological techniques opposed to necessarily on the theory of why things might develop. We found that the psychologist really needs to be flexible, to kind of integrate themselves within the team, be present as opposed to someone that just drops in um, to see service users and a real focus on building relationships with the rest of the ward team and then really being part of that team as opposed to an expert who kind of parachutes in. Um, and psychologists and the project themselves needed training and training and supervising others and in, in team formulation in addition to um, skills in one-to-one -one therapy. In terms of the outcome data, say the main purpose here was not to demonstrate statistic significant effects, but to try and gather the data. We didn't look at statistical differences in terms of patient outcomes because we had such poor follow up in terms of the patient outcomes, the statistics won't be meaningful. Um, for example, because we were left with the patients who were still on the ward at the end of the intervention, that the scores that in that small group would reflect the fact that they were still on the ward as opposed to any kind of real changes. And um, But we wanted to look at the completeness of the data and the distribution of scores. And we found that people were generally happy with the questions that we were asking them about. Um, and in particular, quite interestingly, from the perspective of a future trial, we were able to gather some healthy economic data so people were able to report and record on their uses of services. Um, there were some small reductions in staff outcome measures in the direction that we'd, reflect, we'd expect, but again, nothing statistically significant. We looked at one of the key outcomes for the main trial was, was kind of using the Datex data, and in particular, incidents of harm and aggression. Um, so self-harm, sorry, and aggression to, to self and aggression to others, other patients and staff. Um, so we're interested in how easy this data will be to achieve, how easy it will be to categorise. Um, and as you can imagine, Datex data isn't always the most straightforward to, to uplift and to, to kind of to transplant into your, your outcome measure for trials. But um, we're able to kind of to take the main categories of data that we're interested in and, and kind of sift through to see which whether data was incorrectly classified and reclassify it and take data from other categories that might be more appropriately fitted into our definitions of self-harm and regression and then look at trends over time. Um, and we generally saw a, re a reduction kind of at the three time points um, of the study, suggesting that the intervention might be having an impact on incidents of um, self-harm and violence and aggression. But again, it's not a controlled study, so there might be lots of other factors influencing um, those changes in, in incidents. In terms of key reflections and learning points before we pause for questions, um, I finally suggested that base measures are feasible and acceptable to both staff and patients. However, um, 
more work is needed to increase our follow-up rates. We've had to put lots of work around that into the trial in terms of ensuring that we can follow people up. Um, and I'm pleased to say that our rates are much healthier in terms of the trial. We've got a 73% um, six month follow up rate um, because we put lots of work in to try and um, gather in data from the outset from patients about how we can contact them using lots of different means of contact and our, our, our RAs working really proactively and um, with care coordinators in trying to track people down and using existing kind of clinical appointments such as clozapine clinics and um, care coordinator appointments to really take an assertive outreach approach and um, we've got more resources to do that compared to we had in the pilot study. I finally suggested the overall model of care was acceptable, although we struggled more with the nurse-led interventions. Um, we've tried to overcome that by um, really getting on board kind of nursing um, managers um, prior to the outset of the study and getting their investment in the project to kind of ring fence nurse time, but also um, training additional staff such as nurse assistants who have more time available to try and implement some of that nurse-led intervention. Um, the ward level data was relatively easy to collect from Datex, but we needed to clean that in order to identify our target outcomes. We couldn't just rely on what we were finding in, in Datex alone. I'm going to put my contact details there if you wanted to share the slides afterwards. And I'll just stop sharing slides, shall I? Sorry about that, Catherine. My poor old laptop takes ages to unmute once I click it. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for the presentation. That's fantastic. And yeah, really great piece of work. Um, I'm sure people have questions. Um, quite a small group, so people are welcome to just, just ask a question. I don't think people need to put their hand up or anything. Anyone got a question or comment or reflection on the on the paper? I've got a, a quick question. Um, in terms of the the one to one work that was um, being done with with patients on the wards, what kind of um, what did that look like or what kind of models were you drawing on? Was it kind of CBT focused or was it up to the discretion of the therapists themselves? We had quite a lot of debate in the consensus conference about whether we should specify a model. Um, and we decided that on balance, given that the focus is really on engagement and um, formulation, it didn't necessarily matter what model we were using, um, given that we don't necessarily have evidence based models for this particular um, population in this particular acute setting. So the key was around in, engagement and assessment. And in the main trial, we are rating people on the using the cognitive therapy rating scale, but we're not rating them on the CBT element. We're more rating them on the non-specific factors. So how interpersonally effective they are, um, whether they're able to structure the session, structure the flow of the session, um, as opposed to specific techniques, because we felt it was quite important for the the psychologists to use whatever model they were comfortable with and we were aware that in the main trial certainly that we were drawing on psychologists that might come from a number of different therapeutic schools across the country in order to deliver the intervention so and it's very much a systemic intervention in the sense that it's more about working with the staff team as opposed to necessarily a CBT for psychosis trial where we drill down and we provide one particular type of therapy. Thanks Liz. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, as I am an RMM myself, um, who has a job, um, I'm not working at the moment, but um, on an acute ward, um, I just wanted to ask what you found um, the barriers were to um, nurses um, supporting with delivering the interventions. I mean, I've kind of got an idea in my head myself, but I just mm -hmm. wondered if you identified anything in, in the study. I think from the quality of interviews, it was nurses feeling that they were put on for every single role going on the wards. So there were anything new that was introduced, it was the nurses' role. So this was just another one of the nurses' roles. And, and nurses did want to work with us and they were really interested in this way of working. And essentially that's what they've trained for in terms of being a mental health nurse or a mental health worker. But they were just pulled in lots of different directions. So unless that time could be ring-fenced um, for their you know, one to one time sessions with the service users, it was it was hard to make it happen. So it's not that they weren't interested in it. It was more that there were there was too many competing demands. 
Could I just ask a, a quick follow-up question on the yeah. same topic, and then I'll sit and ask this question. But, so it sounds like one of the ways you worked with it was to actually um, shift the focus from the nurses delivering interventions to nursing assistants delivering the intervention. I just wondered for the, is it, did I get that right? Is that? Yeah, is that's that part of the solution. Right. It wasn't the whole solution. I think it was, it was a bit of both really. I think initially we got in thinking we'll just train qualified therapists. Right. Um, not, I mean, we had different levels of training. So we trained all ward staff regardless of qualification and banding in psychological models and psychological ways of thinking. And then we had more focused training on specific kind of problem areas and emotional regulation just initially for the qualified staff. And then we kind of backtracked on that. That's not a good idea. Maybe we should be offering that um, on a wider level. Then it opens up the pool of mm -hmm. people wanting to get involved in that. And there's quite a lot of skill within the nursing assistant team. And obviously they spend a lot of time with service users as well. So and people are really interested to kind of get involved in that. Yeah. And I suppose I was just wondering, you know, with the future studies, larger studies, would the plan be to use a similar sort of model or would you actually be trying to build in some, um, I don't know, in terms of the economic evaluation of the study, would you actually be building in some of the time the nurses might need to deliver this intervention, you know, rather than trying to squeeze it in alongside all the other things they've got actually to having some. Yeah, that's a good point actually. Um, we are looking at it in terms of the economic costs of the intervention. We haven't officially put it into, in the sense of excess treatment costs. We put the training into excess treatment costs, so people are wards essentially get backfill for staff to attend the training. But the rest of it, in terms of the delivery and the supervision, we've seen it more as a different way of working, as a yeah. of using the resources available as opposed to additional resource. If you see what I mean, to sort of doing things differently rather than increasing the demand on yeah nurses. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point then. Thanks, Catherine. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. How much work did you have to do with the Datex data to get that clean enough to use? I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about how you use that. Yeah, I mean, we're still on the pro for the trial. We're still doing it now because that's a much bigger scale. But um, mm. but for the smaller study, because it was relatively we what we did is three month time points. So we mm. looked at the back full of um, three months prior to the intervention, three months during the intervention three months that's the next three months of the intervention if you see what I mean um so we just initially selected the categories that were interesting which is harm to self harm to patients and harm to staff but we found some events in there that perhaps wouldn't be classified in that way oh. so we had some operational -like definitions of what we meant by self-harm what we meant by um harm oh. to self and, and some things weren't categorized quite in the right categories so we kind of had to clean those out and then when we went, when we went to look at other categories such as, you know, um, I don't know, I can't really think what they were off the top of my head, but some things that weren't obvious by the labels, we found events that we might classify as right. self. So we had to do a bit of chicken around with that. I mean, that's an interesting finding in itself, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, and we've done, subsequent to that, actually, we've done some, because it is our pr primary outcome measure for our, real, our actual trial, so we are really interested in it. We've done some audits um, at GMMH where we've looked at the correspondence between case notes and we've had our um trainees going through kind of case notes and seeing if there's mm. events that they would classify as being a datex event that haven't entered onto datex mm. and whether they've categorized them whether they feel that the staff have categorized them correctly and to be honest it's not as bad as i thought it'd be oh. <laughs> but but there are some inconsistencies thank you and interesting the things that you'd it's quite topical at the moment isn't things like racial abuse which you'd think Perhaps should be a Datex event, but oh. isn't necessarily Datex is one particular thing, I guess, that stands out, or verbal abuse towards other yeah. episodes of verbal abuse towards staff. And obviously people's thresholds differ, doesn't it? So some people are going to classify yeah. that, some people aren't. So interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Mark. Uh, got five minutes left if people have more questions for Catherine. A sort of related question to what I asked before, but in terms of the nursing-led interventions, what what did they look like? What kind of things did that involve? Yeah, they were, I mean, what we've done in the main trial and what we did here is we kind of got got the ward in conjunction with the psychologist to select what topics will be delivered. So um, it was around specific areas that people might be affected by in the ward, such as psychosis, um, anxiety, low mood, self harm. Um, suicidality and it was quite a structured package so it originally came from um, a trial that we were in the department that was a self-help trial so it's kind of a self-help booklet to kind of work through kind of goal setting in relation to those specific problem areas and work through kind of CBT type strategies for dealing with those um, 
but the nurses kind of went through it with the service user um, as opposed to the service user going through it on their own and it, it's an opportunity really to spark some conversations about psychological ways of thinking about things in terms of maintenance cycles but also in terms of interventions each kind of booklet went up to about six sessions but in reality um not people didn't get that far with the booklets it was just often it was about the understanding aspect of it and just touching on coping as opposed to working all the way through and that's just the nature of people's admissions but it just kind of starts that psychological conversation off doesn't it about the ways of thinking about what's making problems worse or what might help make them better yeah definitely thank you Catherine, I was going to ask about the, um, the sort of the, whether you had a sense of what the main outcomes you should be looking at for this sort of intervention should be. So you talked about patient safety. Is that is that the main one you're looking at for the larger? We've actually got sort of... two primary outcome measures for the main trial, and that's because that's what our funders wanted, even though it's a bit tautological having two primary <laughs> outcome measures. But the first one is serious incidents, because obviously that's a huge cost on wards as well, and we are looking at the impacts of reducing costs associated with serious incidents as well, all the time it takes to do the data tax and manage the consequences of those. Um, but, um, and obviously the, that disrupts the environment, doesn't it, and has a negative effect on services and on staff. Um, but we're also looking at patient wellbeing. Um, but the real advantage of the data tax is the data's there anyway. So it's not perfect, but we don't have to worry about losing people to follow up either. So even if we don't get a good follow up rate, from the wellbeing measures of the service users, we've got the primary outcome measure that isn't going anywhere, basically. Yeah. So it is a really good resource in trials, I think, even though it's not perfect. Probably got time for one more question, if anyone has another question for Catherine. Oh, does that feel like yeah. a, a good okay. point for us to finish? OK, thank you for letting me present. Oh, thanks so much for doing that, Catherine. I really appreciate it. It's right. a really interesting study. Um, I'm going to send out the invites for next month's session in a, a week or two. It's going to be a bit, uh, Paul French is presenting next month, so that should be another good session. But yeah, thanks again, Catherine, and uh, nice to see everyone, and uh, hopefully see you at another session at some point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye. Thanks. Bye.